Amen. Again, welcome this morning. We've been in this series called Surrender and taking this imagery of the white flag and saying, what if uh, we could turn that white flag from an image of like utter defeat to an image of, of actual victory? And not because we bring ourselves the victory, but because Christ brings victory in turn into our lives when we surrender our lives to him. So the whole idea is this idea of I'm surrendering something to God so that, uh, so that I can be freed up to be used by God and therefore see victory in our lives. And just so as a way of, of a quick recap, we saw in the first Sunday that we started this series is that uh, the whole issue of inadequacy. There's many of you who struggle with, with this whole phrase of I'm not good enough. It might be in your job, as a husband, as a wife, as a as a son or daughter or as a parent, and you're thinking, I'm just not good enough. And we saw a character, we saw Gideon, who saw himself as a, a, as a wimp. He saw himself as a scaredy cat. And as a matter of fact, when the angel of God finds him, it is like a scared individual. He's cowering. He's scared. And when the angel of God speaks to him, he speaks to him and he says, Mighty warrior. And if you remember the text, he wasn't being mighty or very warrior-like. He was hiding from the Midianites who had been just ransacking their their grain and and their livestock. And we saw that God's view of you is different than the view that you have of yourself oftentimes. You are a son and daughter of the living king. And when you think, I'm not good enough... It's like Jesus is good enough, and he's the one working through you. And so then we saw the whole issue of control, surrender your need for control, and we saw the, uh, the two songs. One of them was Frank Sinatra, uh, Had It My Way. And, uh, and then we saw the song of Vicente Fernandez, you know, Sigo Siendo El Rey. Even though he doesn't have a kingdom or any queen, he feels like he's the king still. And that's a lot like many of us that, we like it our way. And many times the cause for us to say, well, what if there's a better way, but for you to get the better way, you're going to have to surrender your way. Because God has a better way than your way. Not sometimes, but most of the time. And then after that, we moved uh, quickly to this whole idea of surrendering your right to be offended. And I said the right to be offended, right? Because we, we live in a, in, a, in a world that gets so easily offended. We're so ultra sensitive. And somebody says something that just rubs us the wrong way. And we're like, ah, you know, we get so angry so quickly. And, and yet we saw this beautiful picture of what God the Father did for us. God, who was offended by our sin, gives up his right to be offended by giving his son Jesus. And for those who put their faith in Jesus, it's like, wow. But God gave up his, his fury that was coming against me. And the answer is yes, when you put your faith in Jesus. And so we saw that. And we saw Jesus as being the ultimate model of what it means to forgive. Because in essence, that's what we're doing. When we give our right to be offended, we're saying, I- I'm going to forgive. That's a, a way of forgiving people. And some of you may even took the challenge and forgave someone, or you went and asked for forgiveness from someone. And then I have to say that, that uh, this last Sunday, last Sunday was probably one of the sermons that has been spoken about the most, or at least that, that I got when that was being talked about quite a bit. And it was this idea of the need to please. And I hadn't realized that how many of us really struggle with that. How many of us really live our lives so measured by what other, other people think of us. Almost, almost so much so that other people have been put in the place of God and we don't concern ourselves with satisfying God. 
to pleasing God as the chief end goal of ours. And so many of you turn to repentance and you're like, man, I don't want that. I don't want to be ruled by the opinions of others. I want to be ruled by the, by the commands and the opinion of who God thinks I am and what God wants. And it was a beautiful thing to see, just a collective sense of just turn f- away from that and into God and trying to please God with all that you are. And it was a beautiful thing to see. But today is, today's message is going to step on some toes not all of y'all's, but I think for the most part, most of you, uh, because we live in America and we like to be busy. You know, <laughs> the common mantra of Americans is, we do, we don't think, we do. <laughs> you know, we think later. We, let's just get it done. And then once you're in it, you, you start like, hey, wait a minute, this is going to be more than I thought it would be. We live on Mach 5. We live on hyper speed. We love it. Our adrenaline goes up. We like to be busy, you know. I mean, this is, I'm preaching to you, but I'm also preaching to me, actually. Because today I'm going to ask you to surrender your busy schedule. <laughs> Some of you are going to be like, oh, no, but you don't know my job. I can't do that. It's like, I, I know, I know I'm going to be asking something of you that you're not going to like. And that's not that I'm asking you to do this. It's like, there's wisdom in, in, in surrendering your busy schedule so that God can do something that is infinitely better than your job and your life. Surrendering the busy schedule of taking the kids here, there, and everywhere. Sporting season is about to start. I already have my, my little girl, Zoe, like, can I play soccer, please? I was like, oh, yeah, I've done, I've, I felt like I've done my dues, you know. I've already done that with the, with the kids, the boys that did soccer and a little bit with Ziana. I'm like, oh, again, I'm older now. I can't coach. I'm going to coach. Oh, my gosh, you know. So w- I'm going to have to drop some, some boards that I'm a part of. Uh, there was a book called Margin that was written by Richard Swenson. And he, this is what he said about living a marginless life. Well, there's no margin. There's no room for anything, anyone. There's no emotional margin. There's no relational margin. There's no physical margin. This is what he said. Marginless is being 30 minutes late. <laughs> Sorry, give me a second. Because I, I, in my mind, all of a sudden, what rushed in is all of y'all who got here, here late. <laughs> Marginless is be- <laughs> I'm repenting now of that. Uh, I'm not judging you. Just quietly, maybe, but... It says marginless is, <laughs> marginless is being 30 minutes late to the doctor's office because you were 20 minutes late getting out of the bank because you were 10 minutes late dropping the kids off at school because the car ran out of ga- gas two blocks from the gas station and you forgot your wallet. I mean, many of us can, can relate to that. If something goes wrong, different, and your schedule... Somebody walks into your office unexpected, you're like, they're, they're with my margin. All right? Or something comes up, you have a flat tire, or you had to air up your tires, or you have to do something. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, no, I can't, I can't. And maybe you, you've used these expressions like, I have no time. I don't have enough time. I'm out of time. Or, or I only have a few minutes of time. Anybody ever use those expressions, you know? Oh, it's some of you. Some of you are enjoying retirement. You're like, oh, man, that used to be me. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, but I'm still too young for retirement, so I have to struggle with this still. Maybe at the end of the day, you've used expressions like, that, did I accomplish anything? This goes for even if you're retired or you're a stay-at-home uh, mom or dad. Did I, did I accomplish anything? Or have you ever asked yourself this question? Where in the world did my time go? Ever been there? You finish the day at work, you come home, and you're like, what did I even do? You just don't tell your boss that, but, you know, you're like, what happened today? It's interesting that in this this, uh, generation, we've seen that all sorts of predictions have been proven to be wrong. Well, what predictions? The prediction was this. And it, the prediction was that, that by this point, 
with the technology that we, that we have, that we would have, and this is the 1920s, 1930s prediction, that we would have a shorter work week. As a matter of, a matter of fact, the, 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 uh, the professionals of the day were saying that if we still continue to trend technologically the way we were trending, that we would have two-day work weeks. <laughs> That was the prediction. That was the prediction. That our weekends would be so, more, uh, so, so much larger than they are today. So what happened? What happened to this prediction? Well, what went wrong is that, that the assumption didn't match <laughs> the reality because our natural flow of things is not to relax more is to consume more. That's the natural flow. As a matter of fact, it's the spontaneous flow of progress is to consume more of time than less. That's what Richard Swenson said in that book. That's the natural progression. We consume more. In other words, the technology that was designed to give us more time management ends up being used to put more on our plate. Oh, the iPhone came out? That's great. I get more time with my family. Wrong. Because you have the smartphone now. You can do, you check your emails at, you know, at home. You can check your you know, business at home. You can do stuff, more stuff at home. See, all this technology that we thought would save us ended up being the very thing that condemned us, that took our time and shrank it. So we end up with 80-hour work weeks, stacks of bills, endless emails, to-do lists, activities, sports, classes, and commitments, and yet not enough time to do it all. That's where we end up. Our time, our money, our relationships all push to the breaking point Life on Mach 5, always on the go, pace of life. You don't have to have three to four kids, four kids like me, you know, to feel the pinch of not having enough margin or to feel the effects of overscheduling your life. And there's this mantra that we tend to gravitate towards. Maybe you would have heard it in Top Gun. Uh, who watched this last Top Gun? Anyone watched Top Gun this latest? If you haven't seen it, man, you're missing out. This is one of those. This is this is one. That, this is a theater one that, that you get to, you watch there. And so you are still having like that. I don't know. Listen, like it, whatever it takes. Take a gas mask if you need to. Take a bubble. Wrap yourself in a bubble if you need to triple mask it, whatever you have to do, this is the one movie that I assure you will be better on the theater than it is on the actual TV screen in your home. But there's a phrase that is used in Top Gun, the, 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 the first one, which is, which, which you also hear with Lightning McQueen. For those of you who are younger and you're like Top Gun, whatever. Lightning McQueen said this too. I have a need for speed. And that's our mantra. That's our mantra. We like the adrenaline. We like to be on the go. We like to do, 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 and do. If you're a type A personality like I am, confession, it's like, okay, what's next? What do we do next? What's the next thing? I can do more. For those of you who are football fanatics, especially college football, you might remember Colt McCoy. I thought the, the greatest of Colt McCoy, I thought he was great. He's also a like, b- believer. He's a Christ follower. And, and he ended up going to the NFL at some point. And, but when he was at UT, sorry, NM people that are here, when he went to UT, to UT Austin, uh, his first play as a rookie, because he was red jersey for a while, and then he had his first play. And all the hype had been built. Colt McCoy, here he comes. This guy's going to be great, Colt McCoy. And he takes up the first snap. And he can't get the ball out. 
And he gets a second. He can't get the ball out. And then at some point, the commentator, this is what he said, the game is moving too fast for the rookie quarterback. He needs it to slow down. And for many of us, that's what we do. We're, it's going way too fast. And we need to slow it down. And slow it down without feeling guilty that we're slowing it down. So how do you surrender your schedule so you can get a grip on your life? And here, here's three steps to surrender your schedule. And the first one is this. It's going to seem real simplistic, but it's, it's, it's the bottom line. Line up your priorities. You want to surrender your busy schedule, line up your priorities. I love Proverbs 17, verse 24. In the New Good News Bible, it puts it this way. It says, an intelligent person aims at wise actions, but a fool starts off in many directions. Do you notice the contrast there? The intelligent or the wise person acts wisely. They know what they're, what they're going to do. They've set their priorities. They have wise actions. But the contrast is the fool. The fool doesn't. He just starts off in many directions. I mean, I, I, I tend to do that. Instead of stopping, settling, looking at, prioritizing, it's like we are in the go. Boom, that needs to get done. Let's go. You know, we're Americans. We don't think, we do. <laughs> and yet here it says something that's competing. No, no, it's your priorities. An intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts off in many directions. I have this one illustration that it's really hit home here now that I'm 44, turning 45 here in August. It was sent to me when I was in my 30s, so I was like, ha, ah, this is never going to happen to me. And now I'm like, oh, maybe it is now. <clears throat> so this was sent to me It's for my friends over 40. Uh, do you have A-A-A-D-D? I know. Let me explain. Recently, I was diagnosed with, this is, this is an email, diagnosed with A-A-A-D-D, Age-Activated Attention Deficit Disorder. So Age-Activated Attention Deficit Disorder. This is how it manifests. I decide to water my lawn, first decision, water my lawn. As I turn on the hose in the driveway, I look over at my car and decide my car needs washing. As I start towards the garage, I notice that there is mail on the porch table that I brought up from the mailbox earlier. I decide to go through the mail before I wash the car. I lay my car keys on the table, put the junk mail in the gar garbage can under the table, and notice that the can is full. Remember, this started with the grass need, need, needs watering. So I, just, so I decided to put the bills back on the table and take out the garbage first. But then I think, since I'm going to near the mailbox when I take out the garbage anyway, I may as well pay the bills first. I take my checkbook off the table and see that there's only one check left. My extra checks are in my desk in the study. So I go inside the house to my desk where I find the can of Coke that I had been drinking. I'm going to look for my checks, but first I need to push the Coke aside so that I don't accidentally knock it over. I see that the Coke is getting warm, and I decide I should put it in the refrigerator to keep it cold. I don't remember what I did with the car keys, and my neighbors called to tell me he turned off the hose that was flooding the driveway. Then when I try to figure out why nothing got done today, I'm really baffled because I know I was busy all day long, and I'm really tired. I realize this is a serious problem, and I'll try to get some help for it. But first, I'll check my email. Do me a favor. It says, do me a favor. Forward this message to everyone you know, because I don't remember to whom it has been sent to. Help. And some of you, you're like, yeah, that's me. You start off the day... One thing, the next thing, another thing. It's not like, it, we, we you know, I, some of you do with that with conversations, right? You're here, then you're here, 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 here. Half an hour later, here's the point, right? We, we have to wait. But for some of us, it's what we do. We're here, 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 here. We're everywhere, and yet we're nowhere. We're there 
we're not, we're not fully there. So you got to line up your priorities. Zig Ziglar said, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Or another way of saying it, if you aim at nothing, you're going to hit nothing. You got to line up your priorities and decide what's important because you don't have time for everything. In Proverbs 12, verse 11, it says, The hardworking farmer has plenty to eat. Why? Because he knows his priorities. Some of you are, you know, ranchers. You can relate with this verse. When you know your main priority, there's going to be food on the table. And then it says it is, it is stupid or dumb to, taste, to waste time in useless projects. Can you imagine the farmer? They wake up. They, they got to they till the land. They got to plant the seed. And I'm not a farmer, so all this stuff happens, water, or whatever happens. You know, I'm, I'm a city guy. So uh, next thing you know, it, you have you know, the grain or whatever, right? But you work at it. But can, you, can you imagine if a farmer woke up one day or a rancher, you know, and you're like, hmm, man, I'm going to just chill today. Or, or I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to take another project. You won't have food. You won't have your grain. You won't have your hay, hay bales. I think it's, it's called hay bales. <laughs> I did it. I did it right. I've messed, up, I've messed that before. The hay bales. You know? Why? Because you didn't hit your primary priority. You got to know your priority. What's the big one? You have to learn the difference between urgent and important. Otherwise, everything is going to seem more urgent. Some things are not necessarily wrong. They're just not necessary. And this whole idea that, that it's not that it's right or wrong what you're doing. is that if it's not necessary, why are you doing it? I want you to imagine here for just a moment. It would, probably would have been better if I would have brought it, but ran out of time. Imagine, because <laughs> I didn't have margin. <laughs> Imagine just for a moment, you know, I have a little jar. And that little jar, I put my, my golf balls. The golf balls would represent the big priorities in my life, right? Family, friends, church, right? Be, being consistent in church. Your walk with Jesus would be, a, you know, one of those golf balls and, that you'd put in, in that container. And then you would have these pebbles, and there's other things that matter that you would add in there. And that maybe there would be more pebbles, right? And, and those pebbles would be stuff like your job that matters, your home, your car. And then you have the smaller stuff of life. Uh, maybe we'll, we would represent that with sand, right? We fill up the, the, the jar with, with sand. We put it onto the brim. And the sand is, is, is the least of the priorities. But guess what? The, you can put a lot of sand, more sand, little grains, than you can pebbles, than you can golf balls. And it fills up the jar. And you got what? Nothing. All squeezed and packed in there. And many of you, what we, or us, what we need is to add water in there to loosen things up. And water is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We need a lot of the Holy Spirit to help us reprioritize. So I have a question for you, and, and I categorize it from 1 to 10 in your sermon insert. And that is, how clear are your priorities? How clear are your priorities from 1 to 10? Because that might be your challenge today. For me, at the beginning of the week, early Monday morning, sometimes late Friday before I leave, I do what I call a brain dump have this uh, small little journal, and I just put it in categories, stuff that I need to get done for the week to come or that very week, and I just categorize everything. And everything has a set priority to it. I don't always finish my list at the end of the week, but I finish my main priorities. And for many of us, we need to get into that some, somewhere of, of that kind of practice where we're like, okay, what, is, what are the main priorities? And the obvious one is Jesus. And, and if you permit me for just a moment, this is not talking to you, this is talking to the online people, or some of you as regular attenders, is to show up, be part of this family. 
because we've gotten accustomed to online, and it's cool to do online with your PJs on, you know, and your bed as you're sipping on some coffee. But nothing replaces this. There's something unique and special about gathering together as one family when you're seeing each other eyeball to eyeball saying hi to one another. But enough stepping on virtual toes. <laughs> Here's number two. Uh, surrender to the busy schedule by lining up your attitude. Line up. Lighten up your atti- uh, attitude. See, the scripture teaches that stress is not an event. Stress is not an event. The event is the event. Stress is not an event. Stress is an attitude. It's how we respond to the event. The event is not the stressor, okay, although it can bring stressor. It's how you respond to the event. Your attitude. I want you to Im- imagine with me two individuals who are going to the same place, leaving from the same neighborhood, and hitting the same traffic jam. For someone, it may be that they're behind the person in front of them, uh, obviously, and, and it's bumper to bumper, and they're like, ah, I can't wait to get to work. Now, here in Gonzalez, you got to admit, this, it's kind of hard because my commute is seven minutes. And, you know, I used to think, I used to laugh like, man, seven minutes to get to, from house to church. I used to, think, I used to think, man, this is like, in Austin, I was doing like 35 to 40 minute commute. But now, folks, that I've been here for a while, I'm like, oh, my gosh, seven minutes. Man, I sure hope I don't get a, a you know, a, a truck full of chickens in front of me. You know, it's, I knew I'm being real, I've, you know, it's the, the truck with the big chicken. It's like, I don't know if it's uh, Home's Food or or if it's, you know, the, the baker guys, or Tyson food, because they're all here, you know, or, not, no, no offense to some of you, or it's y'all with your horses <laughs> and your cattle, and I'm behind you, you know, it's, that stuff still smells, <laughs> right? You can, <laughs> you can take it one of two ways. You can be like, ah, you know, clench your fist on the, on the wheel and be like, man, I just can't wait to just get to work, but I'm angry right now, and you want to honk because you have an appointed meeting you got to get to, and you're going to be late. You don't want to look like the guy who gets there late when you're the one sitting at the meeting, and so you're honking maybe, you know, not like that matters. It doesn't, and it, please don't honk because they know who you are. We're not, we're not in the big city. If you're in the big city, you honk, not a big deal. They don't even know you're a Christian. You know, you're here in town, you're honking, you know, they know who you are. So I, it's not like I can honk, you know, they know who I am. Everybody knows my truck. So you don't even honk. You just got to just grind it, right? Or you can look at the same event and respond radically different. You know, I was going to say, <laughs> enjoy the smells, but no, <laughs> in that situation, don't enjoy the smells. But you can take it different. You can be like, you know, shh, it is what it is. It is what it is. I mean, this is, this is one that I use often. I may not like the situation. I may not like the situation. But I got to believe that it's good for me. I, use, I'm, I kid you not, I use that a lot. I don't like the way I feel. But I got to believe it's, this is good for me. It's gotta, it's good, I got to believe it's good for me. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man or woman's heart weighs him or her down. Some of you, I don't even have to explain this verse to you. Intuitively, just at face value, you're like, yeah, I came here weighed down because I'm anxious. Let me just uh, kind of dig deep a little bit here like I did first hour. Not really on my notes, but when we are experiencing a deep sense of anxiety and worry, this is what it says about our relationship with the Lord. Some of you are not going to like what I said, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm about to say, because you're gonna, there's going to be some pushback. When you feel anxious and worried, what it means is that we're not trusting in the goodness of God. We're not trusting in the goodness of God. Now, when I reframe it that way, 
Next time you're anxious and worried, what you should be thinking is, am I not trusting in the goodness of God? Because it doesn't feel like it's that way, but if you really think about it, at, at the end of the day, if you really just kind of think about it, theologically and just, if, if God is sovereign, or if he's in control of all things, either, either he permits or allows things to happen or he causes it himself, then, and if you, well, before the then, and if you believe that all things happen for the good of those who love him, then if we're worried, it's because we're trusting in ourselves more than in the goodness of God. In other words, if you're stuck in, 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 in traffic, using that illustration, and you react very anxious and worried, it's because you're not trusting that maybe, just maybe God was slowing you down. If something goes wrong, like uh, several weeks ago, it seems like all of our technology was going wrong before worship. The online wasn't working. A soundboard was uh, causing weird things. The instruments were kind of weird. And, and I think it was just Steve and I who really spoke to the team, and particularly one individual, were like, it's all right. This is the way God designed it. We didn't freak out, did we, Steve? We were like, it's all right. This, is fr- this too is from God. And you may be thinking, boy, but, th- but, but it went wrong. Yeah. God allowed it to go wrong. And you, maybe you guys listening to it didn't see the difference, but internally we we're like, oh, ah. Well, for some, for, us, for Steve and I, we're like, whatever. God has it under control. Mistakes and everything. Because it's, it's this deep-seated belief that God is good. And even when things don't happen the way we want them to happen, that even in those things, God is going to use it for, for our good and for his glory, even when it doesn't feel like that. So line up. Don't take life too seriously. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is one for me. And, and which I now... I can speak from the end of I'm living out the freedom of things not having to be perfect. So now I just tell myself, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just needs to be done. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just needs to be done. And that's okay. Living with that tension. Jim Irwin, a Christian that was part of the moon landing, asked, uh, was asked this, what does it take to be a, an astronaut? He said, first, you need an intense desire to get away from it all. As, as we, an intense desire to want to get away from it all. In Proverbs 14.30, it says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. I, you know, I learned that firsthand when Marisa and I were doing our, our counseling retreat. We, we did two years where we went to a retreat where we got some counseling with other um, couples that were in ministry, other lead pastors and their spouses and, and, in Colorado. And one thing that I learned from them was that, that ironically enough, like pastors tend to have like qu- quite a bit of strokes and heart attacks. And the reason was because, a lot of it was because some pastors get into the custom of being adrenaline junkies. And you don't have to be a pastor to be an adrenaline junkie, by the way. So you have to learn how to relax. A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. Humor is good. Humor is good. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Actually, it's not even going to be advice. I'm just going to tell you what I do. And this is not advice. Disclaimer. We'll put it inside. Disclaimer. I'm not giving you advice. I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be one. I was studying to be one, but I didn't make it. (laughs) Right? You know, I was in pre-med, but I, I didn't continue that. So I, this is not speaking to you as a doctor. I'm not giving you advice. I'm just telling you what we did during COVID. When, when my family has gone COVID, I think all of us have gone COVID already in my family. I was the last one standing. You know, I was the COVID virgin for a while. Woo! You know, and then, boom, went to a conference. And like they say in Spanish, sopas, man, I, I, I got COVID. And, and one thing that, that, that we learned as a family was this, and that was that Early on, what I said was this. Oh, yeah, we have um, uh, retired nurses here. So <laughs> I was just thinking about you guys. 
So this is, this is what I told my family. I said, hey, listen, if you're coughing, wear a mask inside the house. But I don't want you stuck in your room. Because the advice you get is isolate. Go to your room. And, and it has this imagery of, for me, it had the imagery of, oh, you get in your room, somebody knocks, there's the, there's a, the, the, the little plate of food, and then quickly everybody vacates. They just kind of leave, you know, real quickly. And I had learned from my sister, but she got it early on, that it was the most miserable time for her because she was intensely depressed. And she was depressed and anxious because she didn't have human interaction. Husband occasionally from the kitchen would be like, are you okay, my love? <laughs> yes, you know. But then she was by herself, and so we decided early on that we would do what we do as a family. Uh, Monday to Friday, we watch shows together. Now, there for a while, we used to watch Survivor. Most of you know that. We watch Survivor, Survivor almost religiously. You know, the good families, what they do is, is <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm in the good fa family category, what they do is they, they eat together, and, uh, you know, they get around the table, they eat together, they talk, right, after they pray. Well, we don't do that. <laughs> what we do is, like, we get our plates from the kitchen, we go to the living room, we plop ourselves down, I get the recliner, and, and we just watch shows. And so here, recently, uh, this is another thing I'm not recommending, uh, but it's pretty funny. The show that we've been watching, again, not a recommendation, is Impractical Jokers. I don't, know, I don't know who watches that. Uh, it, th it's funny, but it's also like cringe funny, where it's so cringe that sometimes I'm like, ah, is Jesus really watching this with us? And then I laugh. I'm like, eee. hopefully I don't go to hell for that one. <laughs> no, I don't go to hell. I'm eternally secured. But I'm still like, uh, ooh, but it's funny. So that's what we're doing during, during uh, you know, when we got, anyone who's got COVID, We'd say, gather up, grab your food. We'd serve it, you know, for those who had it. We'd go to the living room, white space, and we'd laugh watching a show. And part of it was because I felt like, where's the humor? You know? You know that when you're laughing, endorphins are kicking in. Endorphins are natural painkillers. That when you're laughing, your cortisol levels, which is your stress levels, it's, it's, uh, when, uh, when you're not laughing, they, they go up. You're stressed. So cortisol levels, the, the chemical goes up in your body and therefore it reduces your immune system. So it's like, no, no. Like, they'll, they'll be, you know, as long as they're not coughing, they don't have to wear their mask. There'll be some tapping, you know, some rubbing of backs, a love use. Again, I'm not recommending medical advice. I'm just saying what we did. I love you. Let's go watch a show together and let's laugh together. Why? Because it's important to laugh. It's important to laugh together. Find humor. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, Being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. Ever met the individual that everything, it, it, it's always going wrong? How's it going today? Man, it's a bad day today. And, and, it, and it happens all the time. How's it day? You're like, oh, it is horrible. But you, I saw you laughing and having fun at the walk. No, that's horrible. It's a slow, gloomy death you're getting. But here in this passage, we see that it, being cheerful keeps you healthy. Keeps you healthy. I, I, I've had to learn and make a mind, mind shift because I, I'm the kind of person that, that uh, growing up, I could tell when something was wrong rather quickly. Or like if something was wrong, I was quick to try to correct and try trying to fix it, right? I'm the, I'm the fixer type of person. But in the process, it comes across as critical. And so about, a, uh, about two years ago, decided to change all that. that. The first thing that would come out of my mouth was positive, like cheerful happy, joyful. Before I walk in those doors at church here during the week or before I go into the house, as soon as I grab that knob to open the door, I put a smile on my face and I walk in with a smile. Being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. 
I want you to rate yourself. How positive is your attitude from 1 to 10? How positive is your, is your attitude? Here's number three. The third step to surrender a busy schedule, and that is look up to God. Man, such a no-brainer. No look up to God. This is the most important one. Stress is the warning sign that I've taken my eyes off of the Lord and placed them somewhere else, off the Lord. That's what stress is the indicator of. I am placing my eyes away from the Lord and into something else. And that something else generally tends to be us. Like, maybe I can't do it, or maybe I can do it, or circumstances. And it goes back to the idea that we have to Trust in the goodness of God. In Proverbs 10, 27, it says, Reverence for God adds hours to each day. It adds hours to each day. In other words, the day goes by fast. You don't need more time. You need more time with God. What if you and I gave 10% of our time, of our waking hours, 10% to the Lord, as our first fruits, right? I'm going to give you, God, 10% of my waking time. What if we did then? Martin Luther, the uh, founder of the Great Reformation, which changed everything for us in, in Christendom, said this, I am so busy today, I've got to pray at least three hours. Man, I can barely pray three minutes. See, she had his priorities straight. The busier you get, the more hours you invest with the Lord. In, in Proverbs 14, 26, it says, Reverence for God gives a man deep strength. Do you want that kind of deep strength? The fear of God or reverence for God, you want that deep strength that comes from spending time with him. I want you to rate yourself. How deep is your relationship with God? From 1 to 10. How deep is your relationship with God? And now that you've rated yourself, let me tell you something. You're at that level because you've chosen to be at that level. You will look like the person you hang out with the most. Right? You will talk like, behave like, speak like the person that you hang out with the most. Does it, does it not make sense that we should be spending a lot of time with the Lord? And maybe we would be thinking more like the Lord and talking more like the Lord. Right? And I'm not saying that now you would come in and say, Thou sayest. <laughs> Start using the King James language. That's not what I'm saying. I love the Japanese paraphrase of Psalm 23. I'm going to end with this. The Japanese paraphrase of Psalm 23. I think it's, it's interesting and fascinating. It says, the Lord is my pace, pace setter. I shall not rush. He makes me stop and rest for, for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness which restore my serenity. He leads me in the ways of efficiency through the calmness of mind. And this guidance, and, and his, and this guidance is peace. Even though I have a great many things to accomplish this day, I will not fret for his presence is here. His timeliness is all important. His timeliness is all important, excuse me. He will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of my activity. My anointing, by anointing my mind with his oils of tranquility, my cup of joyous energy overflows. Surely harmony and, uh, and effectiveness shall be the fruits of my hours, for I shall walk in the peace of my Lord and dwell in his heaven forever. Did you catch that? That God is the pace setter. What if that actually was being lived out where God is your pace setter? He sets your pace for the day.